Well, we're back to the days of silent movies, huh? There you go. Hey, welcome to East Bay Calvary. It's so good to see you. I was looking forward to today all week long. I'm just so excited to be with you folks and be able to worship together. If you haven't noticed, this is the week of the pastoral haircut. I got my haircut. <clears throat> PR got his haircut. Pastor Dallas, if you notice, he got his haircut. Pastor Ryan, we take his word for it that he got his haircut. <laughs> Hey, we got a neat crew on staff, and it's so exciting to be able to worship together. Last week, we were able to see the greatness of God. The universe he created is just absolutely massive, and if you have opportunity, if you weren't with us last week, I just invite you to uh, go on our website, eastbaycalvary.org, and look for last week's message, and that'll just help to acquaint us with how gigantic and awesome our God is. And the Bible lays out in the book of Isaiah 40 the greatness of God, and it says this universe, this gigantic universe that we realized last week, we just can't wrap our arms around. It, it says it's so huge, and yet it's just a tent that he lives in. That's how big he is. When we got this understanding, we learned that it's not about us. It didn't start with us. It doesn't continue because of us, and it doesn't end with us. It's all about God. And how is it about God? How do we know when our lives are all about God? Well, I want to introduce you to a philosophical presupposition, and it's the baseline of all of Christianity, and here's what it is. There is a God, and he has revealed himself to us in his word. There is a God, and he has revealed himself to us in his word. And as we work through that, we understand last week, yes, there is a God. He is huge, and how in the world do we ever get to know him? And the realization that we have come to is the only way to get to know specifics, to get to know him, is to connect in this book that he has written. He helps us to know who he is and what he's about and what he's done and what he's going to do and how we can get to know him. So we begin to see that since it's not about us and it's all about God, how do we know our lives are all about God? Well, today we're gonna work through a passage. We get to understand him in his word. So I invite you, would you grab your your Bible, your iPod, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever it may be, and turn to Hebrews in chapter 2. This is an excellent passage that gives us a very clear perspective on one of the bigness, biggest weaknesses we all face regarding our, our partnership and relationship with God's Word. Now, just, just for some quick background, and we're going to get right into this, the book of Hebrews actually has five warnings, five warnings at different places throughout the book. This is the very first warning that the writer of Hebrews discusses, and it is extremely practical for our discussion today about God's Word. And these warnings grow in intensity as one moves through the book, but this first one talks about drifting. We need to be careful not to drift away from God's word. Now, life is full of warnings. There's weather alert warnings. There's warnings on your medication. You better read those, by the way. There's warnings at the gas station. You ever notice that when you go and you fill up with gas, there's a warning right there. It says, you know, do not use your cell phone, touch a piece of metal to discharge any electrical shock. And uh, there's all kinds of, there's warnings when you go through the store, you know, wet floor where they just mopped. Warnings as you drive, watch out, there's a sharp curve coming up. Well, I've got my five best warning signs I could find I wanted to present to you today. My five best warning signs. Let's go with the first one. These are kind of neat. I love this one. Uh, beware of the 
Yeah, I'd say you better beware of that, whatever it is. That looks a little scary. Hey, here's the next one. You're going to like this one. Warning, children left unattended will be sold to the circus. That's actually downstairs in our children's wing that... This is my favorite. Due to the rising cost of ammunition, I'm no longer able to provide a warning shot. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Thanks for your understanding, it says. Now, you're going to have to use your brain on this next one a little bit. Isn't this good? Keep right. <clears throat> Believe it or not, that picture was taken in Kingsley. It was. <laughs> this is my favorite. You ready for this one? This one's good. Touching wires causes instant death. $200 fine. <laughs> I don't, how are they going to collect the money? Is this a prepayment type of a thing? You know, are you going to touch it? We want the money up front. You know, I'm the, oh, what great warnings. So, uh, a different kind of warning, but an important warning. Warnings exist because there is the reality of danger. And the warning is there. I think we know this. It's there to help people, number one, to pay attention. Because there's something big that could happen to you if you don't. And not only pay attention, but follow through on this warning. And today, the writer of Hebrews gives us a very practical warning about drifting. So how about we stand up together? I'm just going to read these verses of Scripture, get the blood flowing for a moment. Here's important passage from Hebrews in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Just follow along in your copy of the Scriptures, if you would. I'm going to read this to you. Notice the warning he starts out with right off the bat. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to do what we've heard so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape? if we ignore so great a salvation. Now this salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Father, we are just about to walk into a warning that all of us, especially myself, we all deal with this issue. Cause our minds and our hearts to be extremely receptive to what you're going to show us. And may we walk out of here no longer drifters, but anchored and settled. And all of you, Spade Calvary said, <clears throat> Hey, let's get to work. Have I have a seat? <clears throat> now, the key point in this passage that we worked through this morning is do not drift away from God's word. Do not drift away from God's word. And I want to give you two key terms to understand as we look at verse 1. It's interesting, in our nautical region, our area of the bays and the lake, these are actually nautical words that the writer of Hebrews gives us in this warning, and, and it's words that we should really align with quickly and understand quickly. There's two key terms to understand, and the very first one, verse 1, if you look at your text, here's what it says. We must pay the most careful attention. Some translations say pay more careful attention uh, my translation says, pay the most careful attention. Just a few notes about this uh, to go in your study guide that's there in your, in your sermon folder, your worship folder. Here's a few things to understand. Pay the more careful attention. This is a constant, current activity. Notice it's not a past one. I hope you paid attention. It's not a future one. 
Make sure in the future you do pay attention. It's one that's current. Pay the more careful attention now, and it is a constant. Continue to pay attention as you go along. Notice this wording here, pay more careful attention, is an intense activity. It's not only a current and constant activity, it is an intense activity. And, and I don't know how to explain this to you any better, but you know, back in the day that this was written in Bible times, ships didn't have sonar. They didn't have GPS. You know, I've been on these boats with, with some folks and, you know, they have depth finders, they even have fish finders. And, and they can see if there's something coming up. They know if there's shallow water or rocks there or something like that. And so the only two things that these people had in Bible times to help them when they were going along in their ship, the only two things that kept them from a shipwreck, you know what they were? These two guys right here. That's all they had. Now imagine... You're going along in the ship. You better pay extremely careful attention. Someone has to have their eyes out at all times looking for rocks, reefs, shallow water, other boats, difficult currents. And someone had to be watching at all times, and that's the idea. This isn't a casual trip that he's talking about. This isn't a Sunday stroll, but rather there is a whole lot at stake and the writer of Hebrews is saying, we better keep both eyes extremely watchful to what's going on. Now notice what he's telling him to be watchful about. The next phrase here, pay the more careful attention, therefore, to what you've heard. And here's our word for the day. So that you do not drift. So that you do not drift. The drifting here. It's not an intentional thing. It is due to inattention or neglect. The word generically means to slip by or to slip off. It's not an activity that is an intentional decision or a deliberate action. This wording has the concept that the slip or the drift is due to thoughtlessness, carelessness, passivity, inactivity. Now, drifting is an issue that we are very familiar with today. There's a few things I thought, you know, what, what do we have out there today that keeps us from drifting on the road? And, and I haven't noticed them around here. From where I'm from, there's rumble strips, both down the middle and then on both sides. And if you start just to drift off a little bit, they, you know, they do this and kind of wake you up. We need, we need uh, something in church to keep people from drifting, if you know what I'm saying. It's why they've invented, you know, new car technology? There is the lane drifting technology. You, you've seen that? There's even the automatic stop if you're not paying good attention. And then God created the original alert system, the wife. <laughs> We're not even going to go there today. Boats drift. That's why there's an anchor. You know, the writers, he's not really concerned about your driving or your boating, but the issue here that he is dealing with is that we can drift in life when we become inattentive or passive about God's word. And I don't know about you, I've been in this ministry thing for 25 years, and from all of my life experience and ministry experience, I think I've yet to experience anyone that went from alert and attending to God's word to going to denying and defying God's word, it doesn't normally happen like that. It's not that they're all in and all of a sudden, boom, they're all out. I've noticed, though, the reality to my life and to everything I've observed in the Christian life is that people tend to drift. It's almost imperceptible. 
It is incremental. It is at a point where we almost don't even know what is going on until we're quite a ways down the drift. It's the old frog in the kettle thing. If they jumped into a kettle and it was burning hot, bam, up and out. But the reality is, since it's a very slow development, they kind of stay in there. They don't even know what's going on. There's two guys that verify this reality. One, Dr. William Barclay. Here's what he says about this. It's really perceptive. He says, for most of us, the threat of life is not so much that we should plunge into disaster, but that we should drift into sin. He goes on, there are few people who deliberately and in a moment just, boom, turn their backs on God. But he says, but there are many who day by day drift further and further and further away from God. He continues, there are not many who in one moment of time commit some disastrous sin, but there are many who almost imperceptibly involve themselves in some situation." And suddenly awake to find that they have ruined life for themselves and broken someone else's heart. And then he he finishes, we must be continually on the alert against the peril of drifting in life. Here's what Warren Wearsby says. Too many Christians today take the word of God for granted and neglect it. He says, in my pastoral ministry, I discovered that neglect of the word of God and prayer is the cause of most spiritual drifting. He finishes, I need not multiply examples because every believer knows this is true. He's either experienced this drifting personally or has seen it in the lives of others. Now here's the beauty today. God's word is so relevant. It today is revealing something that all of us deal with on a routine basis. God knows our weakness and he has propped up the reality that if this thing is really going to be about him, we can't drift away from his word. There's an older song we just sang it right before the service. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, calling for songs of loudest praise. Now here's the phrase, that the writer wrote in this. Remember this phrase. I'm going to tell you at the end of the message. He says this, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. You ever feel that drift? Those little increments? that wandering farther and farther away and and over a period of time, all of a sudden we realize. I want to answer this morning in our conclusion, five, five questions about drifting. Five questions about drifting. You got your study guide. Look at these. What happens when we drift? What happens when we drift? Notice verse two. For since the message spoken through the angels was binding, God's going to hold us to it. The writer uses two terms. He says, in every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? So what happens when we drift? When we drift, there are consequences. There are, number one, life consequences. Now, I want to show you these two words here that he gives. And every violation he mentions, this understanding of violation, this is a deliberate crossing of the line. This isn't drifting. He says, if you violate, that it's not a drift. That is something where I say, I'm going to cross the line. I'm going to go and do what I want to do. And that's what that word means. But then there's another word he calls it disobedience. Every violation and disobedience, and the word disobedience means by imperfect or careless hearing. That is our side of drifting. I didn't hear it right. And notice what he says, whether it's a violation or whether it is a, I didn't hear it well, it says it receives its just punishment. Now, here's the truth that comes. 
whether it is a willful decision or whether it is a passive drift, the result is the same. It says they receive what they have coming to them, a just punishment. The result is the same. Now, I know you may be thinking, Pastor, really? If I make a willful decision to do something wrong, or if I just drift into it, or I don't hear it right, the result is the same? Yes, I'm going to give you an illustration. This is probably about 10 years ago. We were in upstate New York. My wife actually was coming back to Grand Rapids. She was going to help her mom, who just had a, a knee surgery. And so she took our baby at the time with us, our fifth girl, and, and she was all packed up and ready to go. And I had the older four girls with me um, back at the house. And, uh, and I remember my wife's giving me all these instructions. Now make sure you do this and make sure you do that. And I'm thinking, oh my, okay, I've got it, honey, I've got it. And don't forget to do this. And I remember as she was leaving, she says, and if you do the laundry, and then the next words I heard were something like, blah, 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 blah. Go, dear, go, I've got this. Don't worry about it. So she goes, that was Saturday. Saturday night, we all go to bed. Everyone's in their bed. And during the night, one of the girls climbs up into bed with you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna reveal who it was. And you're gonna find out why in a moment. Because we wake up Sunday morning and she wet the bed. It wasn't funny. <laughs> and it's Sunday morning. I've got to preach. The bed is wet. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't believe this. I'm going to do the laundry. So I grab the sheets. I grab the, everything's wet. I just grab it all. I stuff it in there. Get my two by four, cram it down in there really well. I notice there's different settings of how high the water should be extra high. And I turn it right on extra high. Ding, ding, ding. Push the button so the detergent in. Boom, it goes in. Girls, we got to fly. We got to get ready. And I go up and I jump in the shower and I'm getting ready for church. And while I'm in the shower, I hear the girls screaming downstairs. And one of them, Dad, come quick. There's water on the floor. And I'm thinking, oh, they're exaggerating. Sure, there's water on the floor. And so I get out of the shower. I throw a towel around me. I'm thinking, now there's going to be water on the floor. And I go downstairs. And wouldn't you know what? I turn the corner. And coming from the laundry room through the kitchen was this water, the stream. It was as wide as the room. And it was just flowing like this. And I'm backing up like, I cannot believe this. And I tell the girls, quick, get some towels. Of course, the one on me was staying there. <laughs> and, and we just start grabbing everything, and we're throwing them on them. And I go over to the washing machine, and I unplug it. And I think, oh, I can't believe it. Well, I go downstairs, and it's coming through the ceiling. It goes on our, our brand new boiler that was all beautifully electronic, and that fizzled out. I mean, it did $17,000 worth of damage. And then I think the worst thing, not the $17,000, how am I going to tell my wife? <laughs> I'm going to need $17,000 worth of counseling. And so I called her that night. Hey, honey, how's it going? She said, what's, what's up? And I said, well... <laughs> Ah, uh, that laundry thing. And she says, I told you. Never put it on extra high. It seems to leak when you do that. Here's the illustration. I didn't hear her right. So it shouldn't have leaked as much. Amen. The result was no different. I didn't hear her well. I put it on extra high. The result would be the same as if I said, you know what? I'm sick of her telling me what to do. I'm going to turn it on extra high. The result was the same. 
You realize if you drift off the road, the result is the same as if you turn off the road. You realize if you forget to tie your boat in the marina, the result is this, it's the same as if you say, I'm not going to do it. You realize if you do not read your medication correctly, and you take the wrong pills, the result is the same as if you say, I'm going to do this. I don't care about the instructions. And the reality is, we think, though, it's a little less. It's not as big of a deal. I just didn't hear it right. You know, I didn't jump headlong into sin. These are just inches as I go along. And the writer of Hebrews says, gang, it's no different. That's why we need to pay all the more attention. And there's life consequences, but notice this. There are eternal consequences. Verse 3, he says, how shall we escape? And notice the word, if we ignore so great a salvation. We can say, I didn't reject God. I just didn't pay attention. I was never really against God. I just wasn't that religious. And he says, you know, it's the same. If you ignore or if you reject, the result is the same. If we don't listen right, or if we say, I'm not going to listen at all, forget about it, the result ends up being the same. There's consequences. It's the same in life. It's the same for eternity. And there's some people that say, you know what? I was never against God. I just never really got into it. The whole Jesus thing, I wasn't totally sure about it. But if others want to do it, that's great. And the writer says it's not good enough. Jesus says there's only one way. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There's eternal consequences if we do not embrace that. What happens when we drift? Wow. It's the same as if we reject. I'm going to give you a few others. These are some personal things. Uh, why do we drift? There's a few reasons why. You can add some more to it. We get distracted. Okay, You know when you're driving, you can get distracted if you're rubbernecking it, you know, looking at the deer in the field, or you're trying to see what recent message came on your phone, or if the kids behind you are misbehaving, and if you're distracted, the next thing you know, you can be right off of the road. And that's one thing, and it happens in life with our relationship with God's word, and with God, we can become extremely distracted. And before we know it, you know, we're all caught up in all of life, and, and we step away from our focus on him. Familiarity is another reason why we drift. We go through the motions. You know, we have a heart drift. We can come to church week after week after week, and if we're not engaged in it, if our heart isn't in it, we can have an inward drift. Here's another one. Lazy. Lazy. I know I need to... Get into God's word, but I have a 10-minute appointment with Pastor Pillow. You know, I, I just uh, need to spend a little more time there. I don't feel like it. What are signs that we're drifting? There's more than these but I'm going to give you these. We don't spend time with God and his word like we used to. You know, uh, church, and I have to commend you. This is a short commercial. I'm blown away by you folks. This is summer. The water's out there. The boats are calling. The fish are biting. And we're here worshiping together. And I'm just, I'm so excited that we're together, that your heart is here for Jesus Christ. 
And I hope I didn't put any thoughts in your mind. Oh, that's right. What am I doing here? That's not the application, okay? But it can, it can happen. You know, days can go by, weeks can go by, and, and if you've ever drifted, and I have, and I know we all have, the reality is it, it can be like, wow, when was the last time? When was the last time that I read something in God's Word and put it into practice and thought about it during the day. Here's another one. Certain sins are not as big of a deal as they used to be. It's another sign of drifting. We've all been there. And what happens is we realize we're becoming more influenced by our culture because you just don't drift into nothingness. You drift into something else. And you drift into a value set of our society. And we begin to become desensitized to things and we realize you know, it's not as big of a deal you know when I grew up in the day and here was the saying you know come on it's the 80s and they just change that every decade you know come on get with the times the sign of drifting or the third one we rationalize I'm not that far off and here's the comparison thing I see someone else who's drifted farther than me and it makes me feel better because I haven't drifted that far. We begin this comparison thing. They're worse off than I am. I'm really not drifting a whole lot. And, and, and that's another sign we become drifters. The standard is others in the drifter's mind. We measure ourselves by how much better we are than others rather than by measuring ourselves against the standard of God's word. What do we need to do to not drift? Here you go. What do we need to do to not drift? Number one, anchor in God's word. There has never been a day in the history of mankind where it is easier to be in God's word. These are right there on your sheet. They're on the screen behind me. And you can go on any of these sites. ODB.org is our daily bread. Insight.org is my buddy Chuck Swindoll. Back to the Bible.org, and each of these also have apps. You don't even need to go on your computer. You can wake up in the morning, and Chuck Swindoll can be saying, Hey, I've got a devotional for you. It's right there in your phone. And all of us have access to make it easier than ever before to be in God's Word. We live in a day, there's no excuse. I don't even know what to study. Gang, grab your phone. Put one of these on it. You're going to have some of the greatest people in Christianity connect with you on a daily basis of some neat things to look at. It's a place to start. Here's number two. Anchor in God's word. What do we need to do to not drift? Number two, take every inch seriously. Take every inch seriously. I love this quote. Seven days without God's word makes one weak. W-E-A-K. I've talked to so many people shipwrecked in life. I've talked to the addict who wishes they never took, not the last puff, the first one. I've talked to the alcoholic that wish they never took the first drink. I've talked to the people in the affair that wish they never had the first conversation. And so the reality is every inch is important, not just the last three or four, and, and that's how I fell into it. No, 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 no. We fell into it all the way back here when we began to drift and we weren't paying the more careful attention. Take every inch seriously. This third one begs the issue of community. Be with those who take every inch seriously. These are the people to be with. How important it is to be around people that encourage seriousness about these things. To have a community life with other believers. And here's the beauty of it. This is some of the current discussion that's going on with your pastors and with your elders. How can we build better community life here at East Bay Calvary where we all can have this anti-drifter relationship with each other? Don't be around the people that say it's not really a big deal. Do what you feel like doing. They encourage the drift. Imagine how much farther you can go if you have someone that called you every day. Hey, where are you at? What did you read? What did you learn? Let's talk about it. Imagine how much farther you can go 
If someone said, you're going to be a church? I don't know. Well, you know what? I'm saving a seat for you and you better be filling it. How much farther can you go if someone swapped their favorite worship song with you? And flip it the other way. How much farther can someone else go if you called them? If you said, I'm saving a seat in church, if you swapped your favorite worship song with them. We all can go farther in community together if we guard against drifting together. Here's the last question. It's the most serious question of all. And you already know the answer to it. What do we need to do to drift? Here's the answer. To drift, all you need to do is nothing. Nothing. God, we need help. We are prone to wander. I'm a man prone to wander and drift. And drifting requires nothing of us. But God, if this is going to be all about you, we've got to connect with you and your word, and that is the anchor point that keeps us from the drift. God, help us be in it. God, help us to pay the more careful attention and in community, be encouraging each other to watch out. To avoid the shipwreck in life, and wow, to avoid the shipwreck for eternity without you. Friend, would you tune your heart? Have you been drifting? Have you been drifting away from God's word and slowly, incrementally moving away. You don't have to be way down the line. You don't have to be off the road to drift. But if you sense it, and you're weakening, I want to challenge you right now. You talk to God. You make it a point, you're going to anchor. And you're going to connect with others to take every inch seriously. Because if we don't, the result is the same as rejecting. Would you in the silence right now, I'm going to give you 20 seconds, talk to God. Straighten this out with him. Anchor up.